Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsor of the GAA All Ireland Under 20 and Senior Hurling Championships. Hashtag Hurling to the Core. Hello and welcome to the Throw In Independent.ie's GA podcast in association with Board Gosh Energy. I am Will Slattery. Delighted to be joined, as always, by Michael Verney. Michael, hello. How's it going, Will? Yeah, very good. Thanks. Uh, we were really treated to. It was kind of, I know the football championship started like you know a couple of weeks ago, but it was the first real knockout championship, one and done, a throwback to the old days, and it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, you need a, a big scalp take, and once, like, when you see a team like Kerry going out, all other teams will be so on guard now. I, I, like, how many times do you think Kerry will be referenced in other dressing rooms now, you know, when you, if any complacency or anything is going to set in? Uh, it was just, it was just brilliant. Uh, it was just like you talk about last gasp. It was literally the end. They had no chance to, uh, you know, no chance to come back or react to it or anything like that. And um, fairness to Peter Keane, he took it on the chin after, but they must be sick because I'm sure their aspirations were Crow Park on the week before Christmas. And that's all gone out the window now. The thing is as well, that from the, like from a selfish point of view, we're robbed of David Clifford for the rest of the year. Mm. You know, we're robbed of Shawnee O'Shea and a couple of other, you know, players that you'd really like to see. They're driving runs from Gavin White, but you have to take your hats off to Cork. It was a phenomenal display. And they just, they, they made it as hard as they could for Kerry and they gave themselves a chance and they took it when they got it. Yeah, it's funny on the David Clifford point. I was talking to someone like just before the game <clears throat> saying, you know, could Clifford win an All Star like every single year of his career, given how dominant he is in games? Obviously, he won't be winning one this year. So that's already gone out the window. And I think what I enjoyed most about the game was that, you know, we were witnessing for people like maybe our age who, who don't remember the Seamus Darby goal or the goal Tyke Murphy scored for Cork against Kerry. We were witnessing that kind of famous goal. Like we've seen a lot of great games over the last couple of years, you know, but we didn't really get a last gasp goal to win a big championship game when a big scalp was taken. So we're kind of watching our own moment. We know we're going to be referring to for years to come. Yeah, and they, like when people look back at the 2020 football championship, this will, regardless maybe, unless Mayo win the All-Ireland, this is what we'll be talking about. This Because this is what... Um, I would say it, I would just say it re-energize people and you know if there was any lack of interest from some people in the championship this would definitely have uh, reignited it it was phenomenal it was drama it was the highest of high drama it was just it was brilliant and it just there was a sense maybe that something like that could happen as you were watching the game but well we could or, have had penalties if the ball yeah. had gone over the bar it was penalties which is what I thought was going to be happening that's true and you know Luke Connolly who, t- who took the shot could have been you know the the uh, he could have been the villain almost, and it, but it, if it had went wide and Cork were out, instead, you know, he gets the assist for, yeah. for one of the Yeah, he's lucky his history. shot was so bad. It was such a terrible <laughs> shot that it actually turned out to be the assist of the decade almost. Exactly, yeah. No, it was brilliant. Yeah. Um, it's just, I think it was what everyone kind of needed. And as you say, for younger lads like myself and yourself, not that, not that we're that young. Yeah, but young. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get, I'll, if we can get a chance to call ourselves young, I, w- I will. But just to actually see that and... You know, the cut and trust of championship knockout football. That's that is what it's all about. No, it was absolutely brilliant. Delighted to be joined by uh, Martin Brenny and David Brady to recap that dramatic weekend of championship action. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure, guys. Hello, lads. And uh, Martin, we'll start off with the drama in Porky Key yesterday. I know you know so, some fans will remember that famous Ty Murphy goal back in 1983 that denied Kerry on that occasion as well, but it was a real throwback to the days of straight knockout football. Kerry don't have a safety net there out of the championship after one game. That side of the draw now, blown wide open. Like, What did you make of, of the drama yesterday? Well, that's what made it so different. That We were back to the, the days when it was knockout. I mean, if we've seen Cork beat Kerry, maybe not in such dramatic circumstances as since 1983, but even all of those years that they did beat Kerry, the chances were that, that, that Kerry would come back and go forth and land them in the All-Ireland. They very often did. That was it. It was a sheer sense of Shock almost if time stopped with that, with that goal went in. No time to recover. Kerry out. Cork suddenly looking perhaps at an all out final appearance. They don't have to play to Prairie and uh, the semi final work. But just uh, suddenly the possibilities opened up for them. So it was, it was that sense of shock, that sense of something different. And to have it, I suppose, on a, a, a wet November evening uh, at uh, that time, it was, just, it, was just, it was just brilliant in a way, to, to, the way it finished. Uh, uh, you know, there, there was nothing Kerry could do to come back. Such drama, such excitement, and so un- unexpected. And there's no point saying anybody uh, anybody uh, can say otherwise. Yeah, and as you mentioned there, I think in the noughties, uh, on six occasions, Kerry ended up knocking Cork out of the championship in Croke Park. So if the Rebels do progress that far, they'll be delighted not to have to uh, have a rematch there. And David, 
you know, I know a lot has been talked already about Kerry's approach to the game, the, the team selection by Peter Keane, whether they were maybe a little more cautious than they ought to have been. Like, what, what did you make of it from that point of view? Like, the, the, the kind of the tactical approach of the game? Because on paper, Kerry looked to have a lot more firepower than Cork, but it didn't really materialise that way in the end. Look, at for the next 99 years, Kerry might have more firepower than Cork on paper. But it's the reality of what happens on the grass. Um, for me, uh, I thought it was... Um, look, at if we look back, for me, the one thing that stands out, and it was probably during the uh, pandemic part, um, it was the exit of Donny Buckley as the trainer, coach of Curry that created some form of question mark for me. Now, I'm, I can't answer that. Why... Or what what would the outcome have been different if Tony Buckley was there yesterday? But there was there was a change in of 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 mindset, um, and it was a it's been widely known that Tony's mindset and Peter Kane's mindset didn't agree, uh, and the way they wanted to play the game. Now look at um, it 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 became it became a titanic battle in monsoon conditions. Um, the, it was a leveler to a degree, but I do think that. Um, the, the 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 what we've seen the attack and free flowing what you would call attack and half back line uh, and dominant forwards that Curry have that didn't that didn't transpire last night, um, which which for me, you know, for me old man banging the table the minute the goal went in, it was just you know what we haven't seen that in in a lot of GA over the last number of years and it was just. It was an epic battle on a monsoon condition, but the outcome, no one could have scripted it. But let me say, um, I do think that the pen was very heavy from a Curry point of view in completely and utterly writing off a Cork team who who have the bones of, of a very good footballing team. They're, they're buoyed by confidence. You can say Division 3 doesn't give you confidence, but I was in a team before in 1996 that won Division 3 and uh, we came through all the way to an All Ireland final. Um, if you have, if you have unity, uh, it's greater than any confidence. Yeah, well, I know Pat Spillane's headline uh, from his column over the weekend has been shared a lot on social media, where he said he didn't give give Cork a prayer. But Michael, I was looking at the way the game developed. I know while there has been a bit of focus on Peter Keane and the management, maybe some decisions. Some of the key Kerry players, like David Clifford, kicking a number of uncharacteristic wides, two very simple frees towards the end. His decision to turn down a mark as well. Uh, you know, came back to bite them. And then David Moore and one of their leaders, you know, squandered a couple of possessions in the end game as well. So Cork's dramatic goal was great uh, for the finish of the game. But Kerry really should have had that wrapped up, you know, yeah. with a bit to spare. Yeah, no, Kerry probably shot shot themselves in the foot. There's there's things happened yesterday that you would think would never happen. Like Clifford missing like really, really scorable freeze. He put over some great scores, but missing missing chances that you just, even on his worst day, you wouldn't think that he'd be missing. Um they were just very uh, ponderous in possession as well. They, you know, they were in control, but didn't. They were kind of happy enough just to kind of try and keep Corks at arm's length, rather than you know really kind of go and go try and go three or four points up and, and kill the game off. And they left Cork in with a chance. And the great thing about knockout football, and I suppose why everybody is probably singing back to you know the good old days of maybe you know from twenty years backwards after after yesterday, is just that these things can happen. And Cork left themselves and kept themselves in a position where they could let something like this happen. And in fairness to to, to Mark Keane, like Mark Keane had been totally out of the game. He very little had gone had gone right for him. And it was only he touched the ball until oh, the final yeah. moment. Yeah, and it was a weird uh, it was a weird mismatch with uh, with Tommy Walsh being on the edge of the square, which which was very very strange. Jason Foley was taken off just before that, and then Tommy Walsh ended in and up the edge of the square. And you think he would have been at the edge of the square at the far end? So it was a strange one. Um, I think it really like for anybody that wasn't ignited by the championships, this definitely ignited them yesterday. Like it just leaves everybody talk. Everybody's been talking about it ever since, and they'll probably be talking about it for the next couple of days. And it just that just goes just goes to show you, it's like a, you know the old FA Cup back in the days. What can happen in, in a knockout game where there's no back door, no trap door? It was absolutely brilliant. And yeah, I think it's just. Uh, Anybody that needed a bit of energy or anything, or was down a bit, a small, a small bit, they'd say they would have been uh, built back up yesterday. After that, it was phenomenal.
Yeah, Fast Martin, and is there any kind of uh, merit to, to this knockout one and done system that's been brought back in this year? I know, you know, you would have covered a lot uh, when it was in before the qualifier era. You know, is that, are those days gone or does a result like that yesterday in the game and the drama, you know, does it, does it make an argument for bringing it back? It makes an argument for today, but that's about all. It, it does no way can it it, uh, it would be sustainable. I mean, uh, the, the 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 good old days, such as there were, where teams were knocked out in the first round, very often got in the first week in or the middle of May. You can't go back to that. I mean, we've and I always I always look back, for instance, go back to say 19, 1998, Galway beat Mayo in the the kind of uh, the first round as it was. And I think it was the uh, middle of May. And went on to win the All Ireland. If that was if there was a backdoor at that stage, Mayo were probably were probably still a better team at the, at that stage. So I think the the fur, the purpose of a championship is that you have to give the you have to try and have a situation where the best teams eventually get to the uh, closing stages, and the system has to make allowances for that. So yes, it's exciting, it's dramatic, and the whole lot. But no, I don't think I don't think we would, would uh, that would be any great clamour to uh, to go back to straight knockout. Just too much goes into preparing for the championship for just one day or one, one uh, I, I think, no, we'd have, we'd, it, that, that wouldn't work at all. Yeah, David, what's your view? I guess Martin has was referred to one of your county's uh, t- tough losses back in the day. Like, how have you found the knockout, uh, you know, championship over the last couple of weekends and obviously Mayo right in the hunt as well this year? Yeah, I, I think the knockout championship is, look, it's fantastic because, let's be honest, the cream always rises to the top. And if you're given the second opportunity, uh, you can be assured that the regrouping of a Curry team this week going out probably in a week's time in a qualifier, um, someone would, would would bear the brunt of that of that Curry response. But that doesn't come, and you don't get that second chance. And it is the the reality and the dawn of reality last night that Curry are gone, bang, Leinster uh, uh, Munster semi final is gone. It's a whole new world. Look at it, it's for it's for discussion, but I think it adds so much to the the game itself to, to to and again you know what maybe that maybe that innate thing from a curry point of view or a cork point of view known that um we're gone if we lose this um in a in a monster semi-final it probably could have held curry back a little bit um I, it could have been in the back of their minds that this is this is this is all or nothing but again what you have is 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 teams trying to come out of a seven month hibernation play two league games and then Get into the the white heat of battle on um, in in uh, in Parky Cueve, and I think home advantage, um, r- regardless of having no crowd, there was a, a benefit to uh, to Cork. It was it's it was their surroundings, and look at Keen O'Neill, um, he he played a pivotal part in the in the in the talks and the huddles and the and the water breaks that I seen last night, and his experience I think has been vital from a from a Cork point of view. And Michael, on Cork, you know, they had eight debutants involved yesterday, I think four in from the start and four off the bench. Um, and it's really been a growing, there's been growing pace for Ronan McCarthy. His first year, they had two very heavy defeats to Kerry and Tyrone. Last year, getting into the Super 8s, but also being relegated to Division 3. This year, very comprehensively winning Division 3. And, and now this result. And now to Tipperary in a Munster final. Like they, they have a really good chance of making a run and, and possibly you know, going all the way to an All-Ireland final. Yeah, I was in Port Leash when Tyrone absolutely hockeyed them in the qualifiers in 2018 and Rona McCarthy was talking after about there's things that need to change. Uh, I can't tell you what needs to change, but there are things that need to change and happen over the next couple of years. And in fairness, what the, what he, what he's done, like they were they were really, really good last year, very competitive with the dubs, could have beaten Kerry uh, in the Munster semi-final last year as well. Um, had a couple of good uh, results in the qualifiers. They've got from Division 3 to Division 2, They've beaten Kerry. Like it's fairly like it's an unbelievable kind of turnaround. The talent was always there, obviously, and they won a minor All Ireland last year and won an under twenty All Ireland last year too. So there's loads of players coming as well. But uh, the door just opens now. The door really, really opens for them. Uh, saying that, I'm sure Tip will think after their their uh, defeat of Limerick, coming from seven points down at one stage, and Connor Sweeney putting over an absolutely outrageous point to draw in normal time, and Brian Fox coming up to score the winner in extra time they'll probably fancy their chances too and I'd be wary from a Cork point of view definitely not to take them for granted because uh, Tip won't have the same baggage with Cork that they would have with Kerry so I think that's actually going to be really really uh, interesting once they final and it'll probably maybe be a bit tighter than maybe some people think uh, and from a Cork point of view uh, having seen maybe Kerry kind of lose the run of themselves possibly a small bit I'm sure they'll be under guard not to do likewise but there is a great opportunity knocking for them like to possibly win a Munster and then you know, what are the two wins away from being an All-Ireland final who would have uh, 
who would have predicted that at the start of the year? Yeah, Martin, I guess that sort of the draw really has opened up and, that, and it set up a really exciting comic final coming this weekend as well. Obviously, Galway, with the cancellation against Sligo, are going to go in quite under the cook, but Mayo beating Roscommon yesterday looked very, very impressive. You know, how do you kind of look at that game going ahead the next weekend? Well, I mean, Mayo looked very impressive. They, they took it from the start and uh, had, uh, once they established the control, that was it. There was, they weren't going to let Roscommon back in. And they certainly have an, have an advantage now because Galway, as you say, going in under Cook, they had two league games, which one of which they were beaten out the gate by Mayo. The other one lost to Dublin and people say, well, that wasn't good enough performance. But it was, was it really? I mean, they, they were four points up and they lost by, by six. So that's a 10-point turnaround. So, you know, to, to use... Uh, the horse racing analogy, they're going in, they're, they're, they're coming off the gallops of this one where Mayo have had two, two, uh, two good races under their belts. Now, now, I think people, of course, looking at that Galway Mayo League, uh, that league game, you know, you can't read an awful lot into that. I mean, look at last Saturday, last Saturday week, the All Blacks hammered the daylights out of New Zealand. What was it, 38 points or something? And then last, last weekend, Australia came back and beat them. So Galway Mayo, in any, in any championship match, any league game or whatever, it's it's uh, it's it's to, to use the cliche. It's very much on the day, and certainly between them, I'm, there's very very little between them, and right down through the year. So, but the advantage is, is with Mayo in terms of momentum now. There's no doubt about that, and they've looked very good against Leitrim, uh, and looked even better against a good West Common team. Now, West Common didn't fire all that uh, all cylinders yesterday, but that's a good West Common team, and they made them look pretty average. So, they're they're, they're well primed. Yeah, and David, I guess when we've had you on in the past, we've, we've talked a lot about Mayo trying to find young players to come in and supplement what they have there already. And I suppose the flip side of that is it's, it's always very helpful when your key men, your establishment are going well. And at the moment, Killian O'Connor, Aidan O'Shea, even James Horne acknowledged yesterday pretty strongly that these guys are probably playing as good as they've played since maybe, you know, three, four years ago when they were about winning, winning All-Stars. And, you know, Mayo, you must be Mayo, or what's the feeling of Mayo? They're in a very good spot now, the way, the way things are broken for them. Yeah, and, and, and the one word I'll use is solid. Absolutely solid. Solid in the performance, solid in their strategy, and probably more important even, it's solid in defence. Um, I think the realisation that Lee Keegan is needed um, to, to shore up that last line of defence in the full back line with, with um, Oshin Mullen as a newcomer, as a young, a young cub, um, he is absolutely um, fantastic. And I think that's, that's been the bedrock of it. And again, you've said it, the likes of Aidan, the likes of Killian O'Connor and the likes of Patrick Durkin were absolutely outstanding. Killian is sublime. Um, the, uh, Patrick Durkin and the runs that he made um, was, was constant. And if you look at Aidan as a full forward target man, um, look at it, 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 it wasn't the day, probably you know, it was better conditions in the Roscommon Mayo game. But... Again, you have to, as a full forward, come out and link yourself in the play. And we've seen Aiden get more scores already this year, nearly than he's got in the last two championships. Um, it's 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 a solid performance, but where it's based. And let me say this: I have never ever seen a Mayo t- a Mayo forward line work as hard. Now there's working hard, and there be there's been a formula to work hard. So what you have is Killian O'Connor, Aiden O'Shea, and Tommy Connery come back. In a, in a, in a, and it is, it is something new for me all this year. Their first line of defence is their own full forward line back in their half-back line. But from that, they have, they have formulated a counter-attack that has the likes of young Tommy Conroy on the wings. It allows Patrick Durkin to go forward. It allows your half-backs, Conor Loftus as a mid attack midfielder to go forward on the break. Because when they're breaking teams down, they're, they're creating an awful an awful headache for teams because you have guys with momentum and speed that are galloping up the pitch and your ball is broken down. And a lot of it is done on the basis of Killian, Aidan O'Shea and Tommy Connery getting back into deep positions and staying there when the ball is broken down and letting the cavalry and, and the fast guys take the momentum up the pitch. Yeah, Michael, and Mayo in such a good position, and we've kind of touched on there, Galway coming in. There was so much, They were probably one of the most uh, hyped teams coming into the restart after their strong start to the National League. They put up some big totals, but two poor league performances. They missed the chance to kind of get, you know, blow off some of the cobwebs against Sligo in a the game they probably would have won and maybe ironed out some of those kinks. They're coming in in a very difficult position. Yeah, it is a difficult position. If they were coming in 
uh, with the same momentum that they had in March, it would be different because, you know, they had loads of good results behind them. If they were coming in with two good results behind them, it would be maybe a little bit different. It'd still be cold, but they'd be coming in with confidence. But they can't be coming in with a huge amount of confidence after the Mayo result. And even, as Martin says, just kind of letting go of a lead against Dublin, maybe people were thinking it, it, uh, it was a better result or a better performance than it was. And as Martin says as well, yeah, like, it, there's nothing like having games in your legs. And Mayo have two, they have had two. I was up at the, the game in Carrick and Shannon against Leitrim. They got a good, tough game for about 50 minutes and then pulled away. And they were brilliant yesterday. They looked like on point from the very, very start yesterday. And you'd imagine Galway would be a bit, a little bit slow coming out of the blocks in the, in the Connick final. And either that or they might run out of a bit of steam maybe at the end. But there's, there's sure to be some sort of an effect of a lack of kind of game time, a lack of, no matter how good the 15 on 15 uh, in-house games are, they just, they won't be up to the quality of the games Mayo have had. And in fairness to Mayo, yeah, they're looking really, really solid. Uh, loads of injection of enthusiasm and energy, the likes of Oshie Mullen, Tommy Conroy picking up balls in the full back line. And as I said, Aidan O'Shea even playing on the edge of the square, What, what obviously he offers you an unbelievable target. Uh, and he's able to kick a score in there, but his tackling ability inside in the full forward line is huge as well. His ability to be able to turn over balls, even have Killian O'Connor uh, making defensive runs, maybe that you wouldn't have seen as much in the past. He, he's no problem, uh, you know, sprinting 65 yards across the pitch from one, one wing to the other to make a tackle. Um, so it may all look really, really on point. And uh, listen, Galway, like if, if this fixture had been played, before lockdown, Galway would have probably been favourites going into it. It's the other way around now, but probably rightfully so, based on um, what Mayo have done maybe since we restarted. And they're coming in full of confidence. And even with like with Kerry going out and different things, they'd surely be seeing that maybe it's opening up for them a bit now. Like they're obviously one one went away from an All Ireland semi final too, so it's going to be. But as Martin says, it's it's um they're always really really eagerly contested and. You'd almost be a fool to be trying to predict over the last couple of years. We probably thought Mayo were, were going to get their own back on Mayo, on uh, Galway, and they weren't able to. So it's going to be a really, really interesting game. No, it's set up to be a cracker. And I guess one of the one of the so those lesser games in terms of excitement over the weekend, Martin, was Dublin's return to championship action as they go for six in a row. Desi Farrell's first championship game. So it was pretty much done and dusted after about five, ten minutes when Dublin got off to that strong start. I know Westmead, to their credit, battled and compared to some of the defeats they've had against Dublin in recent years, it wasn't too bad. But did anything jump out to you in terms of you know new things says he far abroad or anything of interest, you know, going ahead to the Leicester semi-final next weekend? Well, look, at, well, it was business as usual. And we talked earlier on about Kerry and we'll talk perhaps that Kerry maybe, maybe took a cock for granted a little bit psychologically. But this is the difference. Well, Dublin don't do that. And they, they, they had seen Westmead off, as I say, after 10 minutes. And uh, the, there was the, it was just business as usual. And you think West, Westmead as well, that they would have the... I suppose they were... Uh, they, they, this draw was made so long ago, and Westmead knew who was coming. But that, and that's not necessarily a good thing for the way. They knew they were on their way out. They did their best, but we didn't learn a whole lot new from Dublin. But then we don't need to learn a whole lot new from Dublin. They are what they are, and they're just a, a powerful, potent side. And they showed us that they're ready to go again. Yeah, David, I suppose after the, the kind of the drama of the weekend, you know, with Kerry's elimination, are Dublin still, you know, you know, how do you rate the championship now? Like Dublin, obviously, on like the, the strong favourite still, but, you know, Kerry's defeat show that there can't, in a one knockout championship, there can be drama. Without a doubt. And you know what? There's one leveller and that's conditions as well. And I know the conditions were very poor and there was a very slippery ball. But if you have winter conditions and winter football in the next five or six weeks, um, it can it can dictate a lot of the way a team plays. And I think that um, Dublin handled it very well at the weekend. <coughs> Kieran Kelly was absolutely uh, phenomenal. He seems to have be not reinvigorated, but he 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 relishes every single challenge. But as you said, well, there comes at one time, at one stage, at one moment in a game where everything can turn, everything can flip whether it's an injury or it's a black card or it's the, the, the torrential rain that we've seen. Um, and again, uh, I think Mayo are setting up to play a winter style of football and it could benefit them. But the, no matter what, the, 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 the leaders of the pack are still going to be doubling all the way up until they're, um, they're brought to the, the pin of the collar in a game. Yeah, and David, just before we let you go, what, what is your prediction for the kind of final next weekend? It's, it's delicately poised, but who do you think will come out on top? Let me tell you, Martin Brenton, he said there that Galway are like a team coming off the coming off the the, the gallops and they're only they're only they haven't been tested. There'll be one thing that'll test them, and that's the whip. And the whip has been taken out 
since um, Porrick Joyce, um, and 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 in no uncertain terms, um, said it was one of the the, the, his, the worst performances he's ever seen from a Galway team in his forty three years. Um, they will be psyched up for everything else. And let me tell you, it comes back to the only real. Um, thanks be to God, last night reignited. The only real rivalry in provincial football is still alive and well, and it will be next Sunday. Um, <coughs> it will be no by, by no means a procession for either team. Mayo have the momentum to have the games, and I think to have the 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 probably the confidence of a team that I won't see any changes coming coming to in the next uh, in the next week is going to be the same team, but it's going to take a greater performance than they have in the last two games. Yeah, we always seem to have you on around the time of Mayo Galway games, and uh, this week is set to be an absolute cracker. David, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure, guys. Well, guys, just to finish up on the football, uh, Michael, I know you were at the Kildare Offaly game, uh, you know, yesterday evening, a, a, a late throw in. Uh, disappointment for Offaly ultimately. They had a couple of goal chances, uh, but I think that, as the big story coming out of the game, and I know you covered it in your article today's Irish Independent, was Neil Flynn's contribution off the bench. I think one day after the death of or burying his father, he kicked three points uh, from freeze in a game that was very narrow, like some effort from him. And as was clear, just about got over the line. Yeah, no, it was absolutely phenomenal. He came on about 15 minutes to go in normal time. And by the time he got to about the was it, 69th minute, he, he kicked over his first free. They were only a pint up and like, it was really getting really, really tight. Uh, after it's burned a couple of goal chances that if they had got one or both of them, possibly could have won the game. But Neil Flynn put over a free. Uh, it was between the 13 and the 21-yard line out at the sideline. An outrageous score. And then kicked, uh, got a mark himself around around the middle, around the forty five, and put it over, and then put over another free at the end. And it, Jack O'Connor said it well, like it was a testament to the man, you know, a day after after burying his father Fergal, and he'd gotten very little sleep, and I'm sure was a fairly uh, emotionally kind of distraught even coming into the game. It's some effort to even tug out, let alone come in, and then be able to have that nerve at the end of a game. It was unbelievable, and. There's a great, there's a great picture after he was just sitting down on the pitch, and I'm sure when you go onto the pitch, maybe you're able to forget about it just even for a couple of minutes. But once the final whistle had gone, I think it kind of hit him again. You know, obviously his his dad wasn't there to see it, but uh, I'm sure that was great comfort to him, and it will be great comfort to him over the next couple of days and to his family as well. Um, from a Kildare perspective, Kildare are going to have to improve an awful lot going in against Mead next weekend. They coughed up two or three good goal chances. Um, and you'd imagine Mead would create, after scoring seven goals against Wicklow, that they'll create plenty of goal chances against them in Crow Park. Kildare hit 14 wides, dropped five balls short into the goalie's hands. You know, if, if five or six more of them went over, they probably would have won the game comfortable enough. Uh, good effort from Offaly, from my own point of view. Uh, resolute kind of stubborn effort and stayed in the game a long time. But I think John Martin kind of said it well after. He was unsure about his future with the... The long commute to Castle Bar, and he just think like if they'd beaten me last year in the championship, if they'd beaten Kildare here, there'd be a different perspective on things. But they haven't maybe been able to take that big scalp, so probably a bit of a missed opportunity for Offaly and Kildare are going to have to improve an awful lot. But to keep the horse race in terms, you would imagine they'd come on an awful lot for the run, like they didn't have a championship out in her as Offaly did have one under the belt. But they're going to have to improve a lot for me. Yeah, Martin, it mightn't be as kind of a blockbuster or a clash, but Kildare and Mead very delicately poised next weekend as well. An impressive win for Mead. I know they were playing a team who were in Division 4 this year, but there was a lot of positivity around Wicklow. Uh, maybe that they could potentially run Mead close at least, but wasn't be the case. 7-14 to 7 points. And, you know, the emergence of some of the younger players like Jordan Morris, who was his championship debut, I think he got 3-4, one three of which was for play. That's a very impressive haul. Um, very, very interesting game next weekend. It is, and uh, it's interesting for the viewpoint. We just we will see where exactly Mead and Kildare are at. I mean, they have been the two big disappointments. Let's be fair. Other other Leinster counties training uh, Dublin by a, a long way, but that has traditionally, I suppose, been the case. Well, for a, a, in a lot of times, say, but Mead and Kildare, you'd have to say, given the populations and the resources and everything else they have, they have been shocking disappointment for so long. And even Mead, you know, went thirteen years. Uh, out of Division 1, got back in, went straight back down again this year, uh, Kildare in Division 2. You just have to say, well, where are they at? Are they, they should be closing the gap with Dublin. And, and that's, like, it's not as if, it, that is the big issue that uh, countries like that, that they really have been terribly disappointed. So we'll see perhaps if there's any, any real spark in them to, to uh, that for the, and that the winners will uh, go on where I presume uh, Dublin will, will, will beat Leash, Leash will give it a right go, but Dublin will win will, will the others, the, that other semi final, I, I take it. So 
but it's it's a big chance now for Kildare and uh, Mead, one of them to make a statement, win that, and have a right go up Dublin because they have been too far off the pace, and almost it almost looks as if there was a, a sort of resignation about them that we're so far behind Dublin. That's not the way it should be, but we'll, we'll see. But Mead, there's possibly more in Mead. I think there's certainly more scores on them, and I think in fairness they did. Uh, they, they they were a bit unlucky perhaps in the league some of the games they lost I think there's a bit more in them I think they'll, they'll, they'll reach the final again Yeah Michael I'll give you the last word in the football then in Ulster Cavan saw off Antrim and downbeat for Manor both games pretty close at half time and then down and Cavan uh, extended their runs in the second half and they set up a, a game similarly you know quite delicately poised going into the weekend and a great opportunity for one of them to get into a, a provincial final Cavan obviously having been there last year under Mickey Graham uh, how do you see that one going? Yeah Cavan um like obviously they were relegated to Division 3 and then they're after bouncing back and it was the same like it's amazing like what the win over Monaghan has propelled them given all of a sudden you think there's a roadblock in front of you they beat Monaghan and all of a sudden there's another chance of an Ulster final which would be back to back Ulster finals would be huge for Cavan uh, tight game tight, hard enough to call uh, I think I actually think both semi-finals are quite hard to call I don't think Donegal will get it all their own way against Armagh uh, far from it and I think this is an intriguing an intriguing game in the sense that it's a massive opportunity for both Ulster finals don't come around every year for both and success at the end of 2020 getting to an Ulster final would definitely be success for, for both Down and Cavan um, I, I, don't, I don't know I, I, like, I, like, I, like, I like what Cavan are doing and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they, if they, if they follow up and get to the Ulster final and I said the, the other game the other game is interesting too. Uh, I, I don't think Donegal will get it all the wrong way and they've probably been fairly well hyped now and most people are touting them that they're going to be who Dublin are going to meet in an All-Ireland semi-final, but they mightn't have it all their own way. And just lastly, I mentioned it earlier on, the uh, Conor Sweeney's sideline for, for Tipperary was absolutely unbelievable. Like Everyone talks about uh, Morris Fitzgerald's sideline against Dublin in, the, in their, their All-Ireland quarterfinal in 01, but this was absolutely unbelievable. For a left-footer, basically kind of off the wrong side as well. I thought he was going to, I thought a sticky linesman might pull him for stepping in the yard and onto the pitch. Some linesmen, some linesmen mm-hmm. have been doing that in recent years, which would have been an awful shame. And then just, as I mentioned, for Brian Fox, who's been soldiering with tip football for the goods of about 15 years now to kick the winner an extra time. A huge win for them. A valiant effort from Limerick. Uh, Limerick are, are making great strides and their, their academy and their underage system is flying. They just probably missed their opportunity in normal time, I'd say. But uh, like just when you go through all the teams, aren't there some amount of like glorious opportunities awaiting for you mm. know Cavan down, uh, Tipperary in a like just uh, I put tip. It was announced this morning that Tipperary are wearing the same jerseys that were worn uh, by their by their footballers the day of Bloody Sunday in 1920, and like they're they're potentially only two wins away from possibly having a repeat of that bloody Sunday game against Dublin in an all Ireland final. It might be a long shot at this stage, but there's so many opportunities knocking for teams over the next while. And I think that's the beauty of it all. And even Kerry been out, doors have just opened for, for other teams in, in, um, in Munster and even other teams in other provinces as well. So it's hugely exciting couple of weeks coming up. Oh, big time. And I think the last time Tipperary played Cork in a Munster final in 2002, it went to a replay. So if it's half as close as that was, uh, we're in for a dramatic game. But we'll move on to hurling now. But first, don't forget to share your Gaga box moments using hashtag hurling to the core on Twitter to be in with a chance of winning unmissable rewards with thanks to Board Gosh Energy. And Just Marana's- on that, Will, I think it would be I think it'd be great owl uh, entertainment if we had a, one of those Gaga boxes in Martin Brandy's sitting room. <laughs> I think there'd be fair owl entertainment with him shouting at the telly and different things going on in matches. <laughs> sure there's some mistake <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it and Martin, it, was a, it was a lower key weekend for hurling um, this week was kind of football centre stage but there was two qualifier games Clare versus Leash Leash put up a valiant effort only losing by, by one point and then Cork Dublin I guess Cork rebounding from that defeat to Waterford and a very disappointing display from Dublin but, but Cork looked I suppose a little bit a little bit rejuvenated uh, what did you make of the two games? Yeah I mean uh... Okay, I suppose would, would have been disappointed with the way that they performed against Leash. Great uh, battling performance again by Leash. But Cork, Cork were, were, were much better than they were the, the previous. The previous. Now, admittedly, they were they were up against a double team that uh, wasn't as good as Waterford. So they didn't play as well as Waterford. But yeah, Cork, but Cork, there's plenty in Cork. They do concede an awful lot, and they didn't on Saturday because I suppose the Dublin forwards didn't, didn't perform all that well. But there's a, lot, there's a lot in Cork when they get going. But the irony of it is, I mean, when they'll be looking at, I'm sure the Kerry footballers will be looking at it and saying, isn't it uh, fantastic for Cork and Tipperary and all these hurling teams that they get a second chance that we don't? And uh, 
that's I suppose an argument for uh, another time. But it, it's uh, uh, it, it's still a factor that they're, they're back in, they're back in the race and they're very much back in the race. And so it's like, this is the thing about we've seen it so often in the hurling that there's so little between a lot of the teams that the the, the qualifiers they, uh, the, the, the a team coming through the qualifiers just as good a chance very often as, as the as the uh, the provincial winners. But uh, Cork they're back in it big time and um, Clare. They too, especially with the match against up against Wexford, who they, I think they would probably fancy themselves to. So it's two, two, two very interesting games. Yeah, so it'll be a cracker next weekend. We have Cork Tipperary and Wexford Clare. Uh, so a lot of storylines there. But we just, I suppose, on the Cork Dublin game, Michael, I suppose from the moment Declan Dalton's goal went in after, I think, less than 10 minutes, Dublin never really got close to them after that. So, well, Kieran Kingston will be delighted with the, with the, you know, the fight back shown given the Waterford game the previous weekend. For Dublin, Kind of a very you know mediocre you know championship just kind of petering out like that. Yeah, no, it's str- strange. Like Dublin ended up with Jake Malone at wing back, uh, Mark and Robbie O'Flynn, which I thought was a strange one. He'd usually be out midfield or half forward. Uh, because Owen O'Donnell was picking up Patrick Horgan, he was man marking him. He ended up centre back, but Dublin ended up without a centre back for the first fifteen or twenty minutes because he was following him everywhere. Uh, so Dublin's shape was a bit all over the place. Um, Danny Sutcliffe was the only one really kind of delivering anything anyway decent in the first 15 minutes up front um and they were just yeah they were just off they were just a bit off the pace and tactically maybe about a bit kind of out fox as well Connor Burke went back uh, as a sweeper but I would say that Mark Coleman was definitely more effective in that role for Cork than Connor Burke was for Dublin and Dublin went quite agricultural then at the end uh, tactics maybe you'd more see in a club game uh, they, had, they had a full forward line of Chris Crummy, uh, Liam Rush and Conal Keeney and they were literally just lording ball in and it, I, I don't know they got some, they got some joy off it but I, I, thought, it, I thought it was a, a bit headless and I, th- I don't know tactically they kind of veered from kind of one extreme almost to the other from short passing to just long ball and, and we'll hoof it in and it was strange and they kind of limp out now from a, a Cork point of view I think after three or four minutes you just knew it was a different type of Cork uh, Declan Dalton even coming in and he'll probably be talked about the goal that he got. He, he got out and got a couple of grey hooks and blocks even out around the 65. There were just way more energy to them. Energy with the ball, but more importantly for Cork, energy without the ball. They were closing down men. Luke Mead was out around the middle of the field, got a couple of great scores, but also got a couple of great blocks. They didn't see any hardly any blocks or hooks the week previous against Waterford. They just upped their work rate all over the pitch. Um, as a, 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 like. If they read John Milan's uh, piece in the Indo on Saturday, I'd imagine that would be stuck to the dressing room wall over the next couple of weeks just because he kind of questioned their character. And do you know what? Everything he said was, was factually based because they've just been so hit and miss in recent years. We all know uh, the talent that they have and the forwards that they have, but they just don't seem to be able to pull it together. And I, I, know, I know it sounds a bit silly now and I might think I'm a bit mad, but I literally think that like, Colm Spillan is so important to them. I think he sets a tone, even when he's cornerback. He was fullback the other day, and Dublin, there was no hope of Dublin running down the heart of that Cork defence the other day, just because they knew to be left into the middle of next week if, if he got in near them. And that's the, way, that's the way it is, and that's something that's been missing from Cork. That sort of thing, just where you know, it was open season in some games with Cork. You just knew if you run down the heart of their defence, you weren't going to get met. He was the sort of player that meet them. And even if Owen Cadigan is back and Dara Fitzgibbon could be back for the weekend as well. All of a sudden, things are looking a bit different. I'm still a bit of a, a doubter when it comes to Cork, though, because we, we've had this before. The last year, they were hammered by tip, beat the Rain All-Ireland Champions Limerick the week, a week later. You're just not sure what you're going to get from them from week to week. But that was miles better from them at the weekend. But Michael, one point that you make there about, about Cork, that we carried a table in Saturday's end as well, showing their concession rate over the last five years. And in actual fact, I could have gone back much further than five years, but I just left it at five years. And they were the worst of the nine counties. Uh, I left, I think, the Leash, because Leash weren't in all the, the all Ireland championship in that time. But of the nine counties, they, they were, they have conceded on average the most. Now, that's not uh, in the championship. Uh, uh, that's not our six or seven points behind some of them. Now that, that's not one off or two off. It's five it's over five years. So what I, I, I can never quite figure out how the, defensively how they're be, how they've been so poor and so porous. So, uh, and they've got to correct that. Dublin didn't test it the last day, but you wonder is that correct? Because th- those figures don't lie, and they certainly defensively have been far have been far weaker than than the, all of the other contenders. 
Yeah, no, I definitely worry about that. Like they have a they have a kind of a rookie centre back in Robert Downey. Tim O'Matley's playing wing back. He's played wing forward. He's played midfield. He's played centre forward. He's played centre back. So I think there's still a lot of doubts about them. But they went some way to. They, they, it was just they just had a different attitude the other day. They were just everyone seemed like they were willing to work and put in those hooks and blocks and make those hard yards, which maybe we haven't seen before. So, uh, but like it's not set up perfectly for the weekend. Tip and Cork. Uh, obviously a preview of the Munster football final as well and then you have the Davy Derby on the other side with uh, Davies Wexford coming up against a Clare team against you'd have, you probably would call him his nemesis because they don't seem to get on or talk or have any sort of relationship with Brian Lawn. so it's going to be a really really interesting weekend yeah in many ways sorry in many, in, in many ways, those two games are, are more interesting than the provincial finals because this is not this is knockout whether the two provincial finals are not Pretty yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah, we might finish up with the predictions then for the hurling next weekend, guys. Like Michael, I might start with you. Like, there's, we have two qualifiers you mentioned there, and then those two provincial finals. You've got with Kenny on Saturday night, and then Limerick Waterford on Sunday. You know, some games more I thought was tighter on the face of it than the others. But who do you see prevailing ac- across the weekend? Uh, just on the the Clare Wexford game, just to briefly touch on Clare, like, like Claire, even though they were reduced to fourteen men with uh, David McInerney sent off, Clare would still be would have been hoping to keep uh, leash at arm's length. And they had them. They were comfortable enough. I think it was 16 points to 1-6 at half time. So they were seven points up. And they were under pressure. And they were clinging on at the very, very end. So I'd, I'd uh, even though Wexford were very poor against Galway, I'd probably, give, uh, I'd probably be favouring Wexford in that one. I think you'll get a good bounce off Tipperary. Uh, and I expect Tipperary to beat Cork. Uh, Munster final, I think Waterford will try very, very hard. And their effort will be huge. But I just don't see them having the class to to deal with Limerick. Uh, Leinster final is interesting. If you go through a farm line through Dublin, you wouldn't think that uh, Kilkenny have impressed. Uh, they were impressed that much. And obviously, what half are you taking Kilkenny on? Are you taking them on the first half where they were brilliant or the second half where they were very, very poor? I'd probably just be favouring Galway in that one. So Limerick, Galway to win the two provinces and Tip and Wexford to come through the qualifiers. And Martin, last word for you. Limerick, uh, Munster title. Kilkenny, I think, will win Leinster. I think Clare will beat Wexford. Wexford were unbelievably flat the last. I, I think it I just might have, they, they might have run out of momentum. And Tipperary uh, to beat Cork. So that, that's, 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 that's my four. Martin, yeah. we didn't get your prediction in the Irish Independent jury. I'm wondering, you had the All-Ireland Champions last year and you invariably have the All-Ireland Champions. So at this stage, I'm actually giving you this. You have information available to you now, <laughs> matches available to you. Uh, who's going to win the Hurling All-Ireland? Uh, well, I, I'm glad that you didn't carry my prediction this year because would you believe I, I actually said Cork would win the All-Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually did. It fell off the end of the page somewhere, thanks be to God. But you never know. But uh, I, I suppose I have to change my mind now. I still, I, I don't think it'll be Limerick, believe it or not. Everybody, everybody's going for it. I, 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 I still think that Tipperary will have a big say in this, in this, in this championship. I really do. Happened in 2010, beaten out the gate by Cork. Happened uh, two years ago, beaten out the... Or, uh, have last year, lots of Limerick. Now, in fairness, they didn't play Limerick again, but I still think Tipperary would. I, there, there's, there's something big in Tipperary, but I think, I think um, uh, so. I'm glad, as I say, I didn't. I, I, I left the predictions to the rest if you ask me. And, uh, but I did. I went for Cork. I actually thought there'd be something different in Cork this year, and maybe there will be, but I hadn't done the little uh, analysis of their defence at the time <laughs> of how poor, how poor they've been. But you never know. It could be this, maybe, may, maybe something can kickstart them because they do have real talent. So, I'll, try, I'll stay with I'll stay with Cork and see how it goes. I'm said that I think Tipper will win Sunday. No, no, I think Tipper will win the All Ireland. We'll, we'll make it two in a row for the first time since the sixties. You'll have one horse in the race after the weekend, Martin. Anyway, so you're not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we've kind of been alternating football hurling week on week off in terms of the drama, but this weekend and going forward it looks like it's going to be equal uh, for the next couple of weeks, which is great. For the moment, Michael Martin, thanks so much for joining me. Cheers, what? And that's all we have time for on the throne this week in association with Board Gosh Energy. Thank you so much for listening. We will be back next week with another podcast. In the meantime, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or listen on independent.ie. So until next week, thanks for listening and goodbye.